So just to start off, my name's Russell Hedrick. I'm a first generation farmer from Catawba County. I'm from Hickory, an hour and a half from here. Um, I'm still, you know, the northern side of our, our farms in the upper part of the county. We still have rolling hills, kind of like they are here in Hendersonville. South side, we're more flat Piedmont. So one of the good things about being a first generation farmer is when I went into farming, I didn't have any bad habits. I didn't have that nostalgia of my grandpa and my great grandpa tilling the ground. So I didn't really want to go out there and do that. The bad part was, is we were broke. Uh, you know, going into farming, equipment's expensive. We started with 30 acres. So the equipment that we started with was pretty small scale. Over the past five years, our operations went from 30 acres to 750 acres. The way that we've been able to do that and be sustainable and, and be regenerative is through soil health. So what we're gonna talk about today is kind of our journey. This is where we started out. This was our first cover crop. You know, you look in the magazines, you see cover crops that are this tall. You know, farmers are going out there and planting into them. You'll see some pictures. That's where we're at now. But, you know, when you're starting this out, you don't have to go for the, you know, the maximum amount of biomass. Just start with something that's manageable and then work your way from there. So let's talk about tillage a little bit. I know that vegetables, you know, they do take some tillage. Uh, we're working with some no-till stuff. But I have a love-hate relationship with tillage. I hate what it does to the ground. I like what it does for my bottom line. Just to give you an example, this is a picture of my neighbor's farm. And this is what his farm looks like after a winter here in North Carolina. I send him a postcard and a nice thank you basket every Christmas because he sends me free topsoil and free nutrients every single year. They keep running right down the mountainside onto my farm, so it helps us. My grandpa was a John Wayne fan. If you're gonna go into farming or do anything in agriculture, life's hard, it's harder if you're stupid. You know, really think about what you're gonna do and, and what your impact, on, not only on your operation, but what the environment's gonna be. So what have we seen on our operation? You've, you've heard Gabe talk today, and a lot of things that Gabe said, I'm gonna kind of preach to the choir about. Um, he's talked about the holistic management, the regenerative farming practices, managing those weed cycles and pest cycles, and this is how we're able to do it actually here in North Carolina. So we do a check strip. No matter what we do, every farm that we have has a check strip in it. And you can see in the middle here, we left a corn crop, we planted a cover crop right behind it. We had him bit purple dead and all the nice, you know, annual and biannual weeds that we have to contend with. And on either side of that, we had cover crops in March that were 36 inches tall. Now this was the first year that we did cover crops. We didn't understand the herd impact of putting animals into this system and, and it's kind of hard to see. In the top left hand corner, that's actually a cow pasture. That's a neighboring cow pasture. They graze their fescue down to the dirt. You can actually see a lot of brown in that picture. If we would have known better, we would have allowed them to rotationally graze that field and we would have seen another benefit. But what is the benefit that we saw from something this simple? That right there. We came in there and planted a soybean crop in May. This picture was taken in June. I have suppressed palmer amaranth, pigweeds, morning glories, cuckle burrs, Johnson grass. I mean, there's a lot of the weeds that we contend with as farmers that I was spraying 20, $25 an acre in chemicals to kill these weeds that now for three years, my farm has not post sprayed a corn crop or a soybean crop. Just to give you an idea, we'll talk about some of those chemical reductions, but last year we farmed about 500 acres and between fertilizer and chemical, we saved $62,000. You know, that's a huge benefit for our operation. This is just a picture of that same field you can see when we plant, our planter just simply knocks over the cover crops. It kind of pushes them down to the ground. We still do use one chemical pass over the top. When we terminate these cover crops, we'll use Gramoxone. You know, Roundup and, and other chemicals are a tool. They're a tool for farmers to use wisely. We've decided to use Gramoxone instead of Roundup. Most of our farms have not seen Roundup in the last three to four years. So how does that work out for us? Everybody knows that North Carolina was in a D3 drought in 2015. I had neighbors that got insurance checks. Their crops weren't harvestable. Archuleta came out to our farm. This was taken in August. You can see when we did a little crop tour, I still had beans that were harvestable. We averaged 25 to 30 bushel beans uh, going into a drought. You could simply walk out into the bean crop, move that canopy apart. We still had a nice residue cover. And when you move that residue cover, you heard, you heard Gabe talk earlier about that temperature difference. We're gonna talk about that on our farms here in North Carolina where they're even more prolific than what he has in North Dakota. Where, where we had bare ground, our temperatures were about 100 to 105 degrees. Where we had the cover crops there, we were about 75 to 80. That makes a huge difference for us for, for soil availability. So talking about careless weeds, um, this farm here, this is a lady that goes to our church. We had a farmer that walked away from this land lease because of pigweed and, and mare's tail issues. Uh, they have resistant, confirmed resistant weeds on this farm. They couldn't kill them with chemicals. They didn't know what to do, they walked away. 
We picked this farm up and on a 30 acre farm using diversity, a rotation, and that, that biomass to suppress those weeds, we only had six pigweeds. Uh, you'll see further pictures. This, this uh, kid right here, this is one of my neighbor's kids. Uh, they're farm convicts when they get in trouble, so I get free labor. Um, you know, it teaches them a good thing, but you know, we went out there and we picked six pigweeds out of a 30 acre field instead of spraying $20 an acre in chemical and spending hundreds of dollars. So where did we start? Uh, this is where we started at with cover crops. Um, cover crops when we started were cereal rise with crimson clover and radishes. Uh, Y'all have talked a lot about you know, that compaction layer. Here in North Carolina, about 16 inches down, we have that natural hard pan in most of our ground. What we've seen on our farm is radishes do a good job, but a lot of the small grains that we're planting, the cereal rise, the triticales, the oats, that fibrous root system has done more for us in our hard clays, breaking up that hard pan in that top two feet than what our radishes have. Um, if we're going in too late and radishes aren't a viable option because they do winter kill, they freeze kill, we've started using like a black oil seed rape like Buck Buster or Dwarf Essex and that also gets a really nice deep tap root. So where are we at now? This is one that we use now. We started with three species, this one has nine. This is the home run blend. We've got everything from vetch, cereal rye, triticale, oats, crimson clover and winter peas. And what I said earlier is to start with something that's manageable. If you've never managed this type of system before, you've got to start somewhere. Don't try to overdo it because I promise you there's been producers that have went out there and planted, you know, 12, 15 weight blends their first year and they don't know how to manage those different species and they've had issues. So this is what our ground, this is what our ground looks like when we start. It's that red orange clay. There's really not a lot of structure to it. It's real platy. You can see a lot of the fracture lines. That's where we're at now after five years. We've got about eight inches of, or, of organic carbon that's been leaked into the system. We utilized the Haney test. Uh, we started using uh, his test about four years ago. And when we started this test, our organic carbon levels were between 60 and 70 in a, in a no-till system. Using cover crops, we're now up into the 250s to the 300s. And as you increase organic carbon, you are starting to increase your productivity. So, just to give you an idea, it was kind of a cool thing that was said to me uh, at No-Till on the Plains in Kansas. Organic matter, everybody looks at organic matter as, as being that holy grail. Organic matter is kind of like the refrigerator. Organic carbon is the food inside of it. So you can have high organic matter, but if you're not putting carbon into the system, you don't really have a lot of things to feed the biology. So talking about earthworms, I heard a question in here earlier. Do you need to put earthworms in your system? Five years ago, we couldn't find earthworms on some of our farms. We've picked up the degraded ground that other farmers give up. You know, people will mine the nutrients out of it or till it to the point with tobacco that it's not productive anymore. They walk away from it. We step in and start a regenerative system. As you can see in the picture here, we take a shovel full now. We'll get anywhere from about 10 to 12 earthworms. You can see that cottage cheese, or I think they're, they're saying it needs to be like chocolate cake now. That's the new term. So chocolate cake, you want those those little round marbles in there and you can see that we're starting to get our aggregation. So NRCS came out on our farm back in February and it's something cool that I had never knew before. But when we're digging shovelfuls, however long we've been in this healthy soil system, we're seeing about an inch of aggregation per year in a true no-till system with cover crops and managing them prof you know, the, the right way. So don't get hung up on the equipment. This is Ray Styers. Ray Styers lives in Reedville, North Carolina. Ray hasn't used commercial fertilizers in almost 20 years. Year in and year out, he's growing 150 bushel silage corn. Ray had some health issues and asked me if I would come out and help him plant his corn crop. So as a young farmer, what was taught to me was it was precision, precision, precision. You know, spend a lot of money on a lot of equipment, make sure that crop goes in as precisely as can be. Well, Ray has a 1974 Alice Chambers planter. It's a plate planter. I had never used one before. I took an entire day to study on how this planter works. And we're out here planting his corn crop and this is his row units, and you can see this, this is a down pressure spring here, and you can see the top one, that down pressure spring was broken. I turned around and yelled at Ray on the tractor and said, Ray, your down pressure springs are broken. He said, yeah. I said, well, how long have they been like that? Sometime since the 80s. <laughs> the, I mean, my point of it is, this is about a $2,000 planter. As a young farmer, I've invested about $45,000 in my planter. You know, I thought it was all about the equipment. I didn't understand the ecological concepts of mimicking nature, using diversity. So don't get hung up that equipment is the main key to this. Now equipment can help you, you know, start these practices or manageable in a way that you need for your operation. But just think about what you're doing before you spend the money. So this is where I'm at now. Nobody made a planter that I wanted, so I took an old Kinsey bar, some John Deere row units, and we actually fabricated our own planter. Uh, we're planning into all standing covers. 
So it used to be that we would go and roll down all of our covers into a mat and then plant into them that way. We did have some wrapping issues. We had some issues getting stuff into the ground. So we started going to green planting. In North Carolina, we're getting 40 to 45 inches a year in rainfall. There's no reason that we don't have enough moisture to do this in our state. You know, once you go out into the Midwest and they're getting 10, 15 inches a year, they could have some issues, we don't. So this is what it looks like for my tractor. You know, I've got a 105 horsepower tractor. A lot of the time when I walk out into a field, my cover crops are over my head now. Like I said, we started at about knees, now we're at heads. So that's how we kind of measure everything uh, is between knees, hips, shoulders, and heads. So, you know, that's what you're gonna look at. And I'm telling you now, if you've never planted in anything like that, you'll have anxiety. As a producer, you'll wonder, how am I gonna get through that? But I promise you, if you take the time to learn this, it is worth the practice. So we had, a, we had kind of a challenge. Uh, there, there's really nice chevron pattern rollers out there. There's really nice uh, systems to roll these cover crops down. There was a $100 bet made that I couldn't make a roller system for under 200 bucks. So we went to Tractor Supply and bought two eight inch fence posts, two eyelet hooks, and four pieces of chain. We didn't do anything more than hang them from the front bar of that planter and we rolled over 500 acres of cover crops like that last year. I'm now $100 richer. You know, it's one of those things, again, don't get hung up on the equipment. It's something that you can simply do. But that's what it looks like on the back side of our planter. That's how much residue we won't cover in the ground. Just to give you an idea, when you, need to, when you wonder how much residue do you actually need to manage your farm, when you're planting your following crop, you should still have residue from the last year. 365 days a year here in North Carolina, we've got to keep the ground covered. We've got such a high clay content that when that water splashes on that ground, like Gabe was talking about earlier, that detachment, we run off so many nutrients. The most expensive thing for me to do as a farmer is put out phosphorus fertilizer, and 80% of that phosphorus fertilizer runs off through soil movement. So how do we do that? This is our corn crop coming up. Um, once again, kind of like Gabe, when I first started farming, I was using BT crops, triple stacks, Genuity Smart stacks. Those are tools for farmers to use. It's a tool that I don't need anymore. We're 100% non-GMO on our farm now, and even most of our corn crop now is even open pollinated. Uh, you'll see in some of the slides coming up, we're planting uh, like Reed's Yellow Dent corn, uh, Bloody Butcher, Blue Hopies, a lot of the old heirloom corns. We're still seeing good yields out of them and the profitability still there for our farm. So what do we do in a drought? So I farm pretty much the south end of the county here, all the way across two counties to here. We were in a full scale drought. My, my neighbors were getting anywhere from five to 10 bushel corn. So Ray decided to come out. This was just a picture. I know everybody knew how dry we were in the fall. Ray decided to come out last summer in 2015 and we looked at a true no-till system. This is a no-till system. This is what's been preached in our, our neck of the woods for about 25 years, high fertility, high manure. And that's what his corn looked like. And you can see all the bare ground there, even in a no-till system, his ground temperatures were about 110 degrees. Now, one thing I want you to pay attention to is there's a wood line in the top of this picture. So when you go over here, that was his corn crop, five to nine bushels, he took an insurance check. I promise you right now, you won't be farming long if you use an insurance check, it doesn't cover your cost. So this is what I did. This is the tree line right here that divides my farm from his farm. This was oats, vetch, winter peas, crimson clover, and radishes. We went into there and planted our crop. That's what our corn crop looked like coming up. That's what mine ended up at, 110 bushels. Just to give you an idea, in a meeting, that farmer actually said that my trees were tall enough between my field and his to block these rain clouds. So we're now gonna start selling trees. We're now gonna start selling trees to block rain clouds. So if you need any trees to keep the rain clouds on your property, be sure to let us know. Maybe we can help Gabe with that in, in the Dakotas as well. But my point being is it's about water, water management. You know, as a farmer, I'm all dry land. You know, this year we may pick up some irrigated ground, but you know, the past five years we've been all dry land. You know, we get an abundant amount of rainfall, but the problem was this. First year NRCS came out to our farm that helped us do a water infiltration test. My water infiltration rate was a half inch an hour. After five years of no-till and cover crops, we're at seven to nine inches an hour. You know, how many of those low soaking rains do we get anymore that my grandpa used to talk about? We don't get those. In one hour, we get 10 inches, and then we don't get any more rain for another month, and it stays hot and dry. If you can't put that water into the, into the moisture piggy bank, so to say, you're not gonna have it for your crop, whether it be cash crop or vegetables. So let's talk about integrating animals. So I was a full-time fireman when I first started farming. This crazy guy named Ray Archuleta calls me up. 
And he starts talking to me about mob grazing my animals and a guy's named Gabe Brown and, and guys in Texas like Michael Tom or uh, in Kansas like Michael Thompson and how they're, they're mob grazing their animals like buffalo and how I need to squeeze mine together and put a million pounds per acre. And after about 30 minutes of him talking without taking a breath, <laughs> he finally asked me, he said, what kind of cows do you have? And I said, Ray, I don't own any cows. He's like, you got to get them. And I'm like, Ray. <laughs> Cows are $2 a pound right now. I mean, this was kind of the peak of the market. They're $2 a pound. I said, Ray, I can't afford cows. You know, a 1,000-pound animal back home was going for anywhere from $1,800 to $2,200, depending on which meat processor wanted them. So we actually went out and bought cows. We listened to Ray. Um, how many cattle producers in here? Just show of hands real quick. So here's one thing I'm going to tell you. Everybody in this room, including me, if you're a cattle producer, you overgraze. Even for the system, even for the, the type of weather system that we have in North Carolina with, with annual rainfall, we overgraze continually. And one of the hardest things for me was to take these cows off and move them to another paddock when I still had forage on the other side. But I promise you, if you take the time to understand the concept of this system and how it works, it'll work good for you. So this is our, uh, this is our cows here. You can see that we do our paddocks. It's not hard. Your lines don't have to be straight. There's so many farmers that we go help try to set these systems up in the state, and they want that, they want that poly strip line to be as straight you know, as a surveyor's line would be. Just put the line out there, let the cows graze, and keep moving them. That's all there is to it. This is what it looks like when our cows leave. We used to leave half. Now we leave at least two-thirds because the most productive part of that plant that we're going to graze is in the top third. And then the rest of it's going in the ground. We're starting to see our organic carbon levels increase, our organic matter levels increase. And we started a new test this last year called PLFA. PLFA is just a basic summary test of the biology in the ground. I'm not going to go into detail in it, but it gives you a baseline starting point. If you can pull a PLFA now and see where your biology's at now and look at it next year and see an increase, you know you're heading in the right direction. So this is what it looks like when they leave. This is how we do it. It's about a $60 Gallagher reel. It's cheap money for us to be able to move our animals. It works really great. Then we started integrating sheep. Are there any sheep producers in the room? One thing I've learned about sheep is when the wind blows, they die. <laughs> if you have any help, I'm asking you, meet me afterwards and tell me how to keep sheep alive. You know, we've had so many issues. We've learned, we've learned so many valuable lessons from foot rot to fly strike and stuff like that. But we started introducing sheep in, so now we run our cows. After the cows, we, we run our sheep. Our cows don't eat a lot of the cow peas, but the sheep tend to like them. So we've increased our sheep herd. I think we got about 30, 40 of them now. But the big thing was this. I've got a little acreage behind my house. I've always wanted to do something on it. I started driving T-Post one night. My wife asked me, what are you doing? I'm just putting a fence up. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. The next day she came home, we had 14 pigs. <laughs> um, very understanding and loving lady. I'll tell you that right now. Um, you know, one of the things that I have enjoyed the most about farming is when I was growing up, I, I got to be around a few cows, but I didn't get sheep or pigs. I like pigs more than any animal. They are smart. They are super smart. So this is my daughter. She's uh, getting ready to turn four. Uh, now that she can count, she has 14 pigs and I have none. Uh, we've raised our pig herd. We're up to about 40 now. We're trying to get up to about 100. Um, this is the end result. You know, when you talk about profitability, I know a lot of people in here, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about how they are already doing direct marketing. That's one of the things that I learned from Gabe. You know, cut the middleman out. If you can, you know, use Facebook, use Twitter. That's what we use. It's not hard. It doesn't cost us anything. But we're able to put this product out there and get a market premium for it. Another thing that we do when my neighbor's kids get in trouble once again, they get to do manure samples. Uh, you know, Gabe has his son pulling manure samples. I get the neighbor's convicts. Uh, one of the things that we pay attention to is look at those micronutrients. A lot of farmers just focus on MP and K fertilizer inputs. We follow on the micro and macronutrients. And what we've seen is as we've increased, as we've increased our organic matter levels and these micro and macronutrients, our bulk density and bulk nutrient levels in our products have went up. Instead of our corn being 56 and 58 pound test weights, we're now at 63 and 64 pound test weights. Instead of making 35 gallons of liquor in a run, now we make about 42 gallons of liquor in the run. We'll talk about that coming up. This is just a picture. How late can you plant cover crops? You know, a lot of government agencies say you can't plant cover crops past October 15th in the mountain region of North Carolina and November the 1st to where I'm at. That's bull. If, if there's ground that's bare, it gets a seed. Now, I may not put $35 or $40 an acre into it, 
But this cover crop right here cost us about $22. It was planted two days before Christmas, and when we went back in May to plant our soybean crop, we had about six to 8,000 pounds of biomass, depending on where we were. The biology got fed, organic carbon got pumped into the system, and one thing that I've learned is if the sun will shine on your farm, this system will work there. So how do we kind of manage what we're doing? We always take biomass samples. If you're going to take the time to grow a cover crop, find out what you're getting from it. We go and take a biomass sample. I put mine on a trailer and dry it out. Uh, there's another way that you can do it. You can put it in an oven at 325 degrees and bake it dry. My NRCS DC did that. Uh, he almost got divorced from the smell. So I don't kind of recommend that way. But for us, we do a nutrient analysis on this. What we found out is 50% of the nitrogen, 70% of the phosphorus, and 70% of the potash is plant available to our following crop that same year. Another way that we do it, vegetable production. Um, we do a church garden. It started with a half acre. We're up to about five acres now. Our church has a soup kitchen. We do a couple meals. And when we started doing this, one thing our church member said is they didn't want chemicals put on it. So, you know, this is about the only organic production I do. It's not certified, but we don't use any chemicals or synthetic fertilizers. But we simply take uh, old tractor tires and drag the cover crop down. And then we went to uh, uh, Lowe's and bought a $90 black tarp. We put it over there for about 10 to 14 days. It kills that section of cover crop and we plant those vegetables and keep moving. Another thing that we implemented is instead of tilling this garden now, we just take post hole diggers. We dig the post hole where the plant's gonna go and we plant the plant in place. One thing that that's done is that's helped with our water infiltration rates. That's also helped with our weed management. If you grow a garden in here and I said that you didn't have to go out there and hoe weeds doing this system, how many would, would you like that? You know, that's one of the things that we found out. So talking about rolling cover crops, are there any row crop producers in here by chance? So if you're gonna roll cover crops, this is a picture of my dad. This has been my only on farm help. We've kind of worked uh, by generations backwards. Uh, he'll get done with a furniture factory job. He would come help me. When you roll these cover crops down and you're gonna plant into them, make sure that the width and the travel path match your planter. Uh, we have a highway that goes past this farm and it goes north and south and I told him to roll it north and south. His north and south is about 20 degrees off. And when we went out there to plant that crop, that cover crop residue would catch that planter bar and it wanted to wrap on a lot of things. It really slowed the, the tractor down and we really worried about our seed to soil contact. So just make sure that you're getting, you know, implements that are matched up. This is just another picture of what it looks like when we used to roll them down. You can see when you put it down to the ground, it does make a really nice weed suppression mat. Uh, there were some questions earlier during lunch about uh, fighting pigweeds. You know, one of the reasons we see, we see pigweeds is there's just too much free nitrogen in the system. And one thing that we've monitored on our farm is as we use cover crops and tie up those nitrate nitrogens, we've seen a reduction in those spring pigweeds and mare's tail. So talking about temperature difference you saw on Gabe's slide, uh, this is one of our farms. We were at 77 degrees. This was taken at, uh, around my birthday on July the 5th. Uh, we were at 77 degrees there. You could walk in the same field 10 feet and we were almost 94 degrees at two inches deep. You know, after 85 degrees, the, the, the plants start to transpirate. It doesn't matter if it's corn, vegetables, soybeans, we're gonna lose water through the plant and also through evaporation. So talking about the corn crop progress, uh, planted on May the 6th, you can see that most of the ears of the corn we're planting is right beside of my head. So Archuleta, once again, was here in North Carolina, wanted to see what our corn was gonna look like. <laughs> it's a pretty good year for us. That was the third year in the farming. So talking about, you know, some operational diversity, what it's allowed our, our farm to be able to do. Uh, we actually produce the only legal bourbon in North Carolina since Prohibition. It's called 1712 Spirits. We're based out of Conover. That's where our distillery is. We started out with moonshine. We now do bourbon uh, and we're getting ready to go into some whiskeys. Uh, this was our grand opening. If you can't tell who the farmer is, I was out in the middle of the field and they said, hey, the mayor's coming by. They're going to cut a ribbon. We need you in a picture. Sure thing. Um, this, is our, this was our master distiller, Tim, uh, one of the partners, uh, uh, Zach there, and that's the mayor, and uh, that's Zeb from Old Nick. You can see we started barreling. Uh, stop, you know, talking about seed cleaning, uh, we started using enough stuff that we want to start using local products. We built a build on our farm. We actually uh, use locally grown. About 90% of the stuff we use comes from North Carolina. Uh, we're cleaning it in our building there now. Sierra Nevada is using some of our white wheat for beer production. Uh, we work closely with uh, Riverbend and Carolina Malt Houses, and that's my combine buddy. Uh, she likes picking corn. Uh, like I said, we started going to open pollinated. You know, we didn't have weed issues where we needed a lot of chemicals. So we were able to actually change up and go to some of these open pollinated systems. This is, just happens to be Bloody Butcher. Uh, we're doing uh, Bloody Butcher uh, cornmeal for muffins. 
This is our grits. You saw this slide earlier. I stole this one from Gabe and still use it. Uh, the only difference between mine and his is we're actually doing uh, commercial hemp production now. Most people in the state of North Carolina know that the uh, commission got passed. Uh, we are going to be able to do commercial hemp production. I think this year there's about three to 400 acres in the state. Most of it's going for food grade for seed, but they're also looking at CBD oil. They're looking at the fibrous material, material actually and putting that into concrete and making hempcrete. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, stuff that's going to come from that. I think it's going to be good. This is our cover crop rotation. So this is a four year rotation for us. In four years, it'll see all these cash crops and all these cover crops. And like Gabe said before, you know, when we started looking at these pollinators, uh, the outer, you know, probably seven to 10 feet of our fields, those headlands, they don't produce very well on crops. I love honey. So we started planting pollinator strips and we made a, a kind of a deal with the Beekeepers Association that they put their bees out there on our pollinator strips and, and they get two thirds of the honey and I get one third of the honey. You know, so that's one of the ways we've been able to diversify as well. Talking about reducing inputs, just pay attention to the bottom number there. You know, using the PLFA, the Haney test, actually dialing in our nutrient needs and reducing those nutrients and those chemicals, we saved $62,000 last year. That's huge for our operation. How do we do it? We still do um, a Melic 3, a university sample. It calls for 250 units of nitrogen. This is Haney's test when it comes to us on that same field. Haney called for 74 units. The only thing that he does is he uses a different way to extract it and he also looks at the whole picture. They're only looking at nitrate nitrogen on the university level, whereas Haney looks at all the organic components that are available as well. I think there's 17 or 20 of them that he looks at and gives us that credit. This is one of the graphs that he sends us. This is what Haney said I had in the ground already. That's what he said I needed for a crop. For the last three years, we have farms that have not had phosphorus or potash fertilizer. The only fertility that we've been using is nitrogen and sulfur. So this is what the uh, CO2 burst looks like. Our CO2 burst, when we first started down this path in, in regular no-till, were 60s and 70s. As we've increased the, the organic matter and the biology, our, our CO2 bursts are almost at 500. You can see our organic carbon has grown from about 70 to 280 to 300 on that farm. Uh, this is another picture I was talking to you about earlier, how if you do university, you only get that red half of the circle. Haney gives you this other half in the blue, and you're able to get that full nitrogen credit. So how do we manage that? Every year we do testing. Uh, this is a picture of my district conservationist, um, Lee Holcomb. He's probably one of the best in the state. If you've never worked with NRCS or, or your district conservationist, I, you know, I would tell you to call them up, ask them these questions. They're great for technical advice. So we'll go out here and look. This is going into harvest. I still don't like this. You can still see some bare ground. And what we've noticed is as our soil health has increased, We've also had to increase the amount of, of uh, grasses that we're putting in our cover crops, the, the pounds per acre, to make sure we get enough carbon out there to keep the ground covered. So this is the difference between cover crop and soil health and strictly even no-till. That's not even a conventional system. You can see the difference in the kernel depth, kernels round. You know, the difference is we'll show you the yield monitor. Just to give you an idea, this ear here had 250 units of commercial nitrogen this had 125 units of commercial nitrogen and that had none based on Haney's test. The difference between 250 units of nitrogen and zero nitrogen was only nine bushels. It only yielded nine bushels more to apply 250 units of nitrogen. So to give you an idea, that's about $36 an acre in money that it made me in yield, but I lost $108 in, in you know, money going into fertilizer. So just to give you an idea, we saved almost $76 an acre by not over fertilizing. So how do we measure it? Uh, we entered the yield trial. This had cover crops. This had no cover crops. Uh, this is about a 10 acre field. This is about an eight acre field. We simply split it down the middle. To give you an idea, the eight acre field had 100 more units of nitrogen. So not only did I spend 40 more dollars in nitrogen on this side, but I lost over $100 in yield just by not having those cover crops for that water suppression in place. I mean, we've got some We've got some probes that we're utilizing. They go down in the ground 48 inches and every four inches they measure everything from temperature to moisture to uh, root depth. And one of the things that we found out is just the moisture availability here in the Carolinas that we can get with just keeping that ground covered. So this is just kind of a summary of what I told you earlier. You can see that we lost nine bushels, but we saved that $105 an acre in nitrogen. So we wanted to do a yield plot this year. I was picking some corn 
It started sounding pretty good. I didn't know it was going to yield. We wanted to enter it into the corn trial, so I called my local extension. This is my local extension um, agriculture person for row crops. And when we got out in the field, dry land corn, after five years of cover crop in North Carolina, we made 318 bushels. We made 318 bushels sustainably. This farm only had 140 units of total nitrogen applied to it. 140 units, that's it. No fungicides, no insecticides, no phosphorus, no potash. And, and nitrogen was not my limiting factor. Every year after a corn crop, I pull a stalk nitrate sample. My stalk nitrate sample was still excessive there. Water was my limiting factor. If I would have had more water, we would have seen a correlation to more yield. So if you, you, know, you saw earlier that Dave Brandt had radishes, Gabe has his turnips, I have my 300 bushel corn. If you've never carried it out of the field before, it's pretty hard. You know, that's just a summary of what our operation is. You know, it started with, with no understanding of the system. We started with 30 acres of corn. Now we do corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, oats, bourbon, moonshine, cattle, you know, pigs, sheep. Look at the diversity, not only for the ground, but for your operation as well. When we've had bad crop years, we've always had good money coming from the animals or the other operations, whether it be food or, or, uh, or meat. So just in summary, this is, uh, this is my email address and my phone number. If you've got any questions on making a blend for North Carolina or, you know, one thing that Gabe said earlier, I've worked with a, a lot of different seed people. And if you call somebody, your resource concern should be their main objective. You know, anybody can sell seed, but it takes somebody that actually cares to actually get you what you need to, to do your resource concern on your farm. So uh, just make sure that you know you need what you get what you need. If you've got any questions on how to put something together or anything we've done, uh, we do allow people to come down to the farm now. And uh, if you give us a heads up, we'll give you a tour of the farm. You can kind of see what we've got going on. One thing that I want to say is we're having a field day on August the 5th. Um, we're actually going to have Gabe back and Ray Archuleta. And what we're going to do is we're going to meet at the Crown Plaza in Hickory. That's where we're going to start. We're going to do two field tours. I'm working with the University of Georgia and North Carolina State University on nitrogen management, the Haney test, and some other stuff for row crops and vegetable production. And then also we're going to come back and kind of, we'll talk a lot about what we did today, but a little bit more in depth on what we're actually doing here in North Carolina. So if anybody's interested, you can go to, uh, it's called eventbrite.com, and it's called the Southern Soil Health Field Day. Uh, if you'll look it up and register for it, we're going to limit it to 250 people. Uh, it's starting to fill up pretty fast, but if you're here in North Carolina, it would be a great field day to attend. It's called uh, the Southern Soil Health Field Day. And uh, I tell you what, you know, the one thing that I really wanted to come across, it doesn't matter who's up here speaking. I know Gabe's in North Dakota, and I've been to so many conferences that say, well, you're not from my state and you don't have my climate. The keys to soil health, they all apply. The principles, it doesn't matter where you go. As long as the sun shines on your ground, they all apply there and they'll all work. You may just have to implement them in a different way. So if anybody... No, that was actually just a standard uh, conventional hybrid. Um, the best open pollinated yield I've had so far was 174 bushels, and that was the Reed's Yellow Dent. So, are you grazing on your cropland? We we are on some. Um, so we have an issue. I have 23 landlords that I have to deal with. We farm three counties now, and some of my landlords like animals. Some of them don't. Some of the properties have fence. Some of them don't. And the ones that do allow us to put animals on there, we put animals on there. You'll see, you'll see your ground change twice as fast with animals than you will with just straight cover crops. It's, I think the, the urine and the manure and, and getting that biology through the rumen of the cattle and out the back, I think it does you know, world, a world of difference. So we try to put as many animals on as many acres as we can, but being only one person, I can only manage so many animals and so many acres. So we try to do the best we can with that. How? Well, the first way we integrated it is if they root, they go to freezer camp. Um, when my three, when my three-year-old daughter noticed that pigs started missing in the summertime, they went to freezer camp to cool down. Um, you know, like Gabe said, we have to move those pigs every day or every other day, or they want to root all the way around the perimeter. Um, the poly net fencing, uh, pasture management, just is. I'm not giving them a plug, but that's who we bought ours from. Um, that poly net fencing, we put it out there. We've used, you know, on, on ground we don't have electricity. We've got those uh, stay fixed chargers that take the D batteries. 
that's hot enough as long as you remember to connect the two pieces. Um, we've got a we've got a we've got a church right across the street from our house, and the preacher knocked on the door one day about 12:30, and he said, "Aren't those your black pigs?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, they decided to to join us for Sunday service. Um, they had actually got out because I forgot to put those clips together, and they were." you know, eating all the shrubs and bushes during church and all the kids were cackling, but you know, they took it with a grain of salt and they were nice about it. Uh, you know, just just manage your animals as, as best you can. I mean, they, they're animals and that's all I can say about them. You know, some of them want to root and we get rid of those and the other ones we move as fast as possible. Um, pigs, 90% of their, of their forage or their, their food comes from forage. We do supplement a little bit of grain because we're always spilling grain, moving it or doing something with it. And, We'll chunk it out there to them, but we're not, we're not feedlotting them by any means. And uh, we had a lot of neighbors that didn't like the pig concept at first because they thought they were going to stink. But as we move them around paddocks, just like we do animal, you know, our cows and our sheep, we haven't had that smell issue. How you doing to move? How we get them to move? Take a little bucket with some feed and shake it, and they learn. They're smart animals. Um, it's 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 really it's really no different than cows. I mean, after we had cows for about two three weeks. When they would see us come and take that latch down, they knew they were going to the next paddock and, and pigs are the same way. Anybody else? Thank you for your time, I appreciate it.